It's 11 past 8. Who would you turn to if you're feeling depressed, anxious or even suicidal? Or is it what? Well, not many of us have a quick answer to that and that's precisely what one woman is hoping to change. Eileen Chai was a former national athlete and the youngest Singaporean to qualify uh, for the 1985 SEA Games at seven years old. But behind closed doors, she struggled with a mental health issue, which she only confided in her husband years on. And joining me today is uh, Eileen Chai and her husband, Ben Crannan, who are co-founders of 3AM Music Collective, whose uh, music we're listening to right now is called Still Searching. And it's a project aimed at giving hope and showing empathy to those with mental health conditions through music. Eileen, let's start with you. Tell us a bit about your sporting background. How did you first get into national sports? Well, how I went to sports at that point, I, I was actually four years old. Um, I was actually four years old. And um, my mom thought that I was a very hyperactive kid. So she would get me to... to so, and I was always, you know, getting hurt because I was always jumping up and down the bed and climbing up the lamppost. So I went to uh, a bit of injury and so my mom decided that, hey, I think my hyperactive kid should actually go for some sports training. So she got me into gymnastics. So that was how I got into sports right from the start. All right, clever mom. She she put a little uh, structure <laughs> and order into your into your free spirit. So you you yeah exactly <laughs> yes, and you represented yeah. Singapore at several editions of the Sea Games in artistic gymnastics, athletics, springboard diving, uh, starting yes. from age seven. So what was that for? Uh, what was that like for you as a child? Well, as a child, um, I because I was so hyperactive and I was quite a curious kid as well. So. Uh, every little thing that I learned was learning. It was very interesting for me. Um, so I, I never got tired of it. I, it. It was more of, hey, mom, let's go now, rather than my mom pull, pulling me out of bed and, and getting for my training. So so I was a highly motivated kid. So when I got involved into all these sports, um, it was very fun for me, especially for gymnastics when I was a child. Yeah. And Eileen, you suffered from yeah. social performing anxiety for years. Tell us more. Okay, so, um, well, I was selected to participate at the Southeast Asia Games in 1995 when I was seven. Uh, after the Games, I was even more willing to try to put in more time and effort to be better at the sport. So at nine years old, I realized that I wanted to make consistent progress with no interruptions in my training so that I could learn, you know, more difficult gymnastic moves. Um, so I mean, as a child, as I mentioned, I was highly motivated. So my hands bled and, and I would leave blood stains on the Ivan bars at the disgust of my teammates. Um, so when I got to China to train, um, I was able to take the hardship, but what I didn't expect was the loneliness. So there were times when the weeks would go by without, in, in China when I was training, I, there were times when I would go by without even saying a word in a week. So, and I was nine years old, a kid that was growing up so there was the growth development and all that but i so during that time I was so lonely i didn't have friends so when anything happens during training i didn't have anyone to turn to as well so what happened during the training first of all um um well i must say during the time back in the late 80s and the early 90s when we had a lot of asian values where respect of authority is of vital importance uh, the coach was the authority, so they command lots of respects. So through the years, the coach, and, and also through the years, the coach, they themselves were gymnasts as well. So the way they coach, um, is a pattern that they were followed as they believed that uh, they would produce results. So meaning that they will really push the athletes uh, to their limits. Um, so during training, well, uh, because of that training mode, uh, quite a bit of fear was instilled in us, but because I was a foreigner, they treated me better. But when you see your best friend who, who was a Chinese uh, gymnast from the village, uh, she was my best friend at that point in time, being thrown with angry words at a young age, 
uh, you, you fear that the next person might be yourself. I mean, at nine years old, um, you know better, right? So, and, and being lonely there without friends to talk to, uh, you basically have no one to turn to to make sense of what's happening at the end of the training session. And, and the training gets very tough as well with, um, I had, I mean, as a, as a gymnast, as an athlete in general, you get a lot of injuries. So at nine years old, there was no one to return to, to have a physical hug or even to talk to anybody. So I would always say to myself, I'm, <laughs> I'm useless. <laughs> Uh, reason being just so that I could distract myself and numb away the pain from my joints. Um, and also because at that point in time, I knew that my parents had done a lot for me to get me to China to train and all that. Um, I wasn't going to let them down, so I would just keep everything to myself. So having said all that, my childhood was kind of like, uh, like in a foster care because um, if, if one has done the adverse childhood experience study, which is called the ACE. Uh, ACE basically uh, looks into the developing brains of uh, a, a child uh, that could actually create a response to, to when we actually grow up decades later. So my ACE score came up to five, um, which, which is not a very good score because the lower the score, the better it is. So through the years of such experience, I developed the anxiety. Uh, especially social performing anxiety. I was always on the edge trying to block out the fear of being scolded, being judged or not doing well, and always having to be best. And you later pursued a career in music and, and uh, became an accomplished violinist. So what prompted this career switch? Um, what prompted was because after my last sport, which was diving, I practically was very tired, physically, emotionally, physiologically. I, I was really at the brink of exhaustion. Uh, so I needed a break from sports. Uh, so for a few years, I didn't know what I was going to do until when I was at the NU, uh, National University of Singapore, I happened to pass by um, the Center for the Arts and I heard music coming from from the rehearsal studio. So I actually peered in and then say, wow, <laughs> so many people compared to the time when I was, was training alone. Um, so many people and all of them were laughing. Everybody was talking with one another. So uh, that, that really got me excited with music. Um, and also because when I was four years old, I did pick up the violin as well. So it was a uh, instrument that I was familiar with when I saw the orchestra with the violinist playing, uh, laughing and having fun together. So that really got me started and, and I went back to music. Yeah. Yeah. I'm chatting with uh, Eileen Chai and we'll hear from her husband, Ben Cranon a little later. They're co-founders of 3AM Music Collective, a project aimed at giving hope and showing empathy to those with mental health conditions through music. More on that after we check on On Nightlife, we're chatting with uh, the co-founders of 3AM Music Collective, a project aimed at giving hope and showing empathy to those with mental health conditions through music Eileen Chai and her husband, Ben Crennan. Um, we'll hear from Ben a little later, but more about uh, uh, you, Eileen. And, and you know, you, you, yeah. you, you, you spoke about your, your mental health issues earlier on. And you were, yes. you were a performer. You, perf you were a physical performer when you were young. And then yes. even, I mean, music is also physical performance. Performing, right so did, how did your uh, you know mental state affect did they affect your performances on stage whether in the field or you know on the stage or music hall well I, I guess um, to tell you the truth for the past few, few years um, I never knew I had this problem but I did know that when I had to perform I always had to put in a lot of energy just to block out any form of uh, so-called fear or anxiety that I have to perform on stage. So I will always give my 101% just so that I can get through the performance. So that means every time when I get on stage and to perform or to give a speech, uh, it really took out a lot of energy from me. Um, so, I mean, as much as I love to give, I wasn't, I was giving and giving, giving a lot through my performances and my speaking engagements, uh, at least that was back in 2013 to 2015. 
Um, but I never give myself enough time to rest. Um, but I, I still continue to do it. So, but on, so what happened? So how did I actually sort of figure out what happened? So in 2015, uh, at the end of the year, I had an interview, uh, by Mediacorp, uh, for a Channel 8 program that was called They Are My Parents. Um, the producer, which became a good friend of ours, <laughs> um, uh, he asked, quite a number of questions that really dug deep into my childhood and because of the questions um suddenly it was like a pandora's box opened um and i started to realize what has been going on in my life uh i actually really did have some problems in my childhood uh, where uh, there was anxiety and there was a lot of fear as well but i've been using um, the, the way I've been doing when I was training in gymnastics by blocking out the fear, by blocking out the tiredness, by blocking out my anxiety. So how I do that is by just laughing it off and just be energetic every time. Um, so, at, well, you know, back in 2015 when I, when I suddenly realized, uh, I like had epiphany moments, realized that that was a problem. But um, although I realized that was a problem, but I didn't real, I didn't, uh, understand that if I were to seek help, uh, that might actually be okay. I didn't trust anyone. I, I probably didn't trust uh, seeing a psychologist or even a psychiatrist at that point in time. So fortunately, uh, uh, Ben intervened and you played a huge role in helping Eileen understand what she was going through. So tell us about that. Uh, yes. So, uh, well, Eileen uh, already explained about this, this outgoingness, this bubbliness, and, and that's the, the, the side you will first see of her. Um, but there, I, I also, you know, being with her, I also saw that other side, and, and sometimes she could really overreact on, on small things. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and <clears throat> of course, it can also mean somebody's very stressed or, or tense, but it, it, it was quite a, a, a pattern. And, and on, on top of that, she started saying, and as you mentioned this before, uh, she, she kind of felt useless and, and uh, she, she would actually express this at a certain time. She would, oh, I hate myself. I feel useless. I'm a bad person. And, and maybe I, I add on to this so that um, uh, illustrates that because, for example, I, I would, when after we got married, I would easily pick a fight with Ben because I always feel that Ben is undermining me. I feel like he always looks down on me. But to tell the truth, although I have this kind of thoughts, but the other side of my brain tells me, actually, that is not true. So my internal brain was really fighting with one another. I couldn't figure out why. It's like, I know he's a good guy. He's definitely the best guy that I have known. That's why, I, that's why we got married. Oh. Um, but, um, but the other side of my brain, I was always always trying to, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, um, feeling bad uh, uh, about, I'll, I'll get frustrated with a lot of things. So when I get frustrated, it's not because I'm angry with him, but I was more of angry with myself. Then when I get angry with myself and I start throwing hurtful words at Ben or even my mom actually to tell the truth, um, I will get very upset because why did I do that? They are all there for me, but yet I cannot control my emotions. I cannot uh, you know, a think through my thought process properly. So, yeah, so, yeah. so this is the problem that I'd like to illustrate yeah, yeah, and then yeah. can continue <laughs> from here. Yeah. So, so, the, um, so I, I really thought that this, this went, and of course I, I'm, I'm not a psychologist. So I didn't know how, how deep it went. We only found that out uh, later, but uh, initially we started doing some, some online therapy with um, a psychologist and, and that already helped, but uh, the, the, there wasn't this, this connection. And, uh, but at least Eileen had taken that step of, of accepting. And I think that is also the uh, core of our... Maybe I wasn't too accepting at that point. And maybe <laughs> that yet. was the reason why uh, online uh, sessions was not working for me because I was mm. not ready to accept yet. Mm. It wasn't the psycho psychi uh, psychologist uh, problem. It was my problem. I, I couldn't accept it yeah, yet. Yeah. Not, not yet. Yeah, not yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. So when, when that's, that stopped, I, I, I started um, looking around um, and I, I was looking for somebody who could do both um, like psychotherapy and medication if necessary. So, so like a psychiatrist. And I, I did, did, did some phone calls and, and then finally I ended up with this, this wonderful person, uh, Dr. Ken Ang. Um, I, I went for a, a consultation uh, there 
uh, to to talk about this. And again, he, I think he, he mentioned this. He said your first challenge will be to convince your wife, Eileen, to come to my practice. And I think that, that was it's also I think fundamental for why we took the step of the three AM Music Collective, because that taking that first step. It's, um, uh, that's really what, what, what it takes to, to make that change. So finally, uh, I, I went back and fortunately, I think mentally, uh, she was kind of ready. So uh, it didn't take a lot of pressure to make her visit uh, Dr. Ang. Okay. Yeah, so and uh, we're running out of time at this portion, but Eileen, Ben, we'd like to get back to you and continue conversing with you about the healing power of music uh, after the news around about uh, 8.45 onwards. So uh, we'll talk to you later. Uh, ben and Eileen, uh, Eileen Chai and her husband Ben Crannon, co-founders of 3AM Music Collective, a project aimed at giving hope and showing empathy to those with mental health conditions through music. Now this is one of the pieces uh, that's being used. Don't worry, they've got more. <laughs> it depends on which stage you're in, you see. So this is the bring it on stage, right? like your inner evanescence has broken through or something. No, no, uh, don't listen to that. Imagine what but yes, uh, 3AM Music Collective and we'll continue to chat with uh, its co-founders Eileen Chai and Ben Crannon after the news in about 15 minutes time here on Nightlife. I'm Eugene Lowe for Nightlife on CNA 938. It's uh, 8.50 and 3AM Music Collective is a project uh, aimed to help those with mental health conditions through the healing touch of music. And um, that's part of uh, the uh, Beyond the Label Fest where you can check out at facebook.com slash beyond the label. SG and uh, Eileen and Ben, welcome back. The both of you set up 3AM Music Collective. So tell us more about that. Uh, let's hear from Ben. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, you, you mentioned uh, already the, you know, the, the the healing power of, of music, um, and music is the language uh, that that uh, me and Eileen speak. Uh, so we, when we wanted to do something. To, to help other people to reduce that stigma and, and to, to, to make sure that people feel comfortable uh, seeking help. Um, and we came up with this idea of, of um, some kind of a, a concept album. And then, of course, uh, nowadays, um, uh, a concept album is just a bit, uh, in the time from, you know, um, Spotify singles, uh, EPs, it's, it's not so current anymore. So we wanted to have a storyline uh, of, of 10 songs, a cycle, where each song by itself is also uh, enough, it will have its own little storyline and, and, and a, a positive twist to it. So it's, it's a journey that we're describing actually. Uh, so it starts with uh, being kind of happy, then something goes wrong, uh, then the, the, the wondering, the anger. The, you, you played that that hard rock song already. That's the, the anger, right? And so then, and then there's this this epiphany, like, hey, I can find help. I can get out of this. So then, then the, the circle ends, and and you come at, at a point where you say, okay, yes, I can, I can uh, take life as it comes. So we we wanted to to have uh, different styles. We have many different styles, uh, different um, age groups, different ethnicities. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that there's something there for everybody, um, and also uh, something for for every mood. So depending on the mood, are you more like I, I want something really yeah happy, or I want something more uh, know, more serious, more reflective. Uh, so that's why we also had. Um, the still searching that that classical piece that you started with that that's really more thinking and um, 
Yeah. So uh, yeah. So yeah. so the the journey that Ben Cranon was uh, mentioning is actually uh, the, to chart the journey of the emotional cycle, emotional psychological journey of a person who is suffering from uh, a mental health condition, for example, depression. Yeah, so so um, this is why we 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 wanted to to create this this music of the ten songs, so that when a person listens to the journey of a person who's going through a mental health condition, they will feel that oh that that actually I'm not the only one, right? Yes. So, so yeah. like like how how Ben has been always been there for me. So I feel that hey, I'm actually not alone. So. Uh, being there for one another from the songs you, you realize that uh, you're not only one when you feel this when you hear the song at 3 a.m uh at midnight you you actually hear about sing uh songs of hope and 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 you realize that hey actually if i stay up a few more hours later the sun will come out again and the day is going to be bright again mm. so this is what we want to achieve when they hear the 10 songs um they feel a sense of hope and let's listen to a bit of the, the, the music. I've got this one. Uh, I've got this together. You tell us a little bit more about it before we begin. Um, uh, th this, this is also the uh, song, one of the, those pivotal moments where you realize that this is in the journey where you first uh, went down and down and down. And this is the, per the, the moment where you realize Hey, uh, I, I I can get out of that. There there is help. I can I can reach out. There, uh, I've got this together. Very cathartic sort of stuff, and uh, that's I've got this together uh, from 3 AM Music Collective, which is co-founded uh, by Eileen Chai and Ben Crannan to help those uh, who are going through emotional problems, kind of like you know, express their feelings through music. Um, and and uh, you're also involved in the Beyond the Label Fest, which is a national mental health anti-stigma campaign held virtually this weekend. Tell us more. Okay, so um, uh, actually, just to make a correction, uh, what you just broadcast was actually the uh, silver lining. That the is anger. The ang ang angry <laughs> one. So, so when you're feeling angry, that's a song that uh, uh, when you hear it, because you are feeling angry, and when you hear it, you, when you hear the chorus, you still actually sing and hear about the songs of hope because there is a hope in in the element yeah. in that song as well. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> but it's good to actually have people to know that, you see, even a song like this with anger yeah. can actually still deliver hope. So so yeah. it's no problem. Exactly. Very yeah. cathartic. So tell us more yeah. about this uh, so, Beyond the Label first, then we'll play the actual I've got this together. Sure. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so Beyond the Label. Beyond the Label, um, beyond the label itself, uh, they, they are talking about uniting to to talk about removal of, of stigma, uh, with regards to people with mental health conditions. So same goes for 3M Music Collective. We are on board on this as well, that we are using music to create conversations to talk about mental health, right? We, because we want people to, to realize that it's, it's okay to, to, to acknowledge that you have a problem and, 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 and you start to seek help for it through the music that we are delivering to all of, all, to everyone. So this Sunday, what we are going to have is Beyond the Label Festival virtual concert that will be played live on the Beyond the Label Facebook at 8 p.m. So what you, what audience will be actually looking at and listening to is the journey of the 10 songs. One common denominator in the 10 song is actually the violin. The violin actually repeats the journey of a person who's going through a mental health condition. So, um, and the narration will actually be done by Benjamin King, who will be yeah narrating the the, the story as the music is going along. All so right. actually, it's going to be quite exciting. Uh, and and there are 
And you can check out more at Beyond the Label Fest at facebook.com slash Beyond the Label SG. Eileen Chai uh, and Ben Cranon, co-founders of 3M Music Collective. Thanks so much for the conversation. And this is uh, 3M Collective with The Real. I've got this together. It's true. All these chains, they tie me up in pain and I'll break through. Time to make a change, I'll never be the same. I fell so hard, been down and out. I found my way on solid ground. Grow stronger, tougher every day. I'll fight on every step. Seem so close to victory. It's worth Beverly Morata, Grafton, Wenita uh, uh, Che, and uh, Ben Crannan uh, from 3AM Music Collective. Uh, and you can check out Beyond the Label Fest at facebook.com slash Beyond the Label SG. I'm Eugene Lowe for Nightlife on CNA 938.